Hi, my name is uh, Nick Fitzgerald, and my presentation is titled Source Code Cartography. Before I really dive into it, though, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up and was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and I lived there all the way until I moved about an hour north for school, where I go to Western Washington University for computer science. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the problem I was trying to solve and why it was important to solve that problem before I really get into the technical aspects because I think the grand aspirations are a lot more interesting than, than the uh, technical implementation. Um, and so the premise of the problem is that the code that the browser evaluates is not the code that you wrote. And that could be generally for two reasons. One is you used a minifier, like Clojure Compiler or Uglify.js, and um, the reasons are pretty straightforward there. You want to minimize the file size of your script before you send it to the browser so that your web app loads faster. Uh, but the other reason that's kind of on the rise now is compiling some language into JavaScript and then executing that code. And uh, the problem when you do either of these is as soon as you get a bug, it becomes really hard to uh, debug that bug because the uh, location that's being reported by the browser is the problem isn't necessarily the same location as um, the code that you wrote. So you'll get a file name and a line number, but it's the wrong file name and line number. You have to look into that, see how that matches up to your original code that you wrote, and then debug from there. So there's this whole extra layer that's kind of unnecessary, and that's where I came, I came in this summer, and I, I uh, worked on a source map project, um, which basically we, we have this file format that says these regions of code in the generated script map back to these regions of code in the original script. And um, by integrating this stuff with developer tools, we can remove that layer of trans, uh, translation that you have to do in debugging. Um, and so, why would you want to do this? Uh, you know, why go to all this trouble to compile to JavaScript if it's going to make it so much harder to debug? And the answer is that uh, JavaScript is a great language, but it has a lot of blemishes. For example, uh, variable hoisting, where variable declarations get pulled to the top of a function. Or if you forget that var in front of your assignment um, or declaration of a variable, then you're going to accidentally create a global. Um, you know, the type coercion. There's a lot of, of small blemishes, um, but there's even more than blemishes. There's missing features. Uh, everybody, depending on where they come from, has a favorite feature, uh, you know, depending on what languages they've used in the past. And the big two are like modules and classes. Uh, everybody like re-implements these over and over in JavaScript and there's hundreds of libraries doing this and it's wasted effort because everyone's doing stuff that's been done before and really we could put that effort towards making the web a better place. Um, and then there's like kind of syntactic sugar things. Uh, for example, earlier this year I was reading uh, Chris Okasaki's great book Purely Functional Data Structures and I decided for the heck of it I was going to port some of these examples from SML to JavaScript, and uh, so I'm I'm porting this you know pure red black tree right, and I get to the balance function, and it's 45 lines of code in my JavaScript implementation, and the SML is only four lines of code. Um, so this is a great example where pattern matching and syntactic sugar for that kind of thing would really make writing JavaScript a lot nicer. Um, and so. So let's say you've identified a feature that you want to add to the language, and then you, or you've identified a blemish that you want to fix, and you go to the ECMAScript committee, you're like, let's make this better for everyone. You're, you know, really happy. You're like, you know, let's make it better for everyone. And, you know, you find out ECMAScript moves really slowly and at a conservative pace. And that's not necessarily their fault because rushing is what caused a lot of these blemishes in the first place when JavaScript was written in like a week by Brendan Nike. Um, so, you know, they're very, very, very conservative and everybody has to agree upon it because it's a committee. 
Um, and then once it gets standardized, then you have to wait for the browsers to support it. And then once the browsers support it, then you have to wait for the users to upgrade to those new versions of the browser, which, you know, as IE6 has told us, uh, takes forever. Um, so the, the answer to this really is to write your own language and compile it to JavaScript. And if you do this, you can move the language as fast as you want and break backwards compatibility. Um, you can add whatever feature you want because it's yours. And all you have to do is compile to browser-compatible JavaScript. And, uh, you know, you can protect your users from all of these kind of warts and blemishes um, by making sure the var is there so there's no accidental globals, etc. And, uh, you know, Mozilla really wants to help people do this because what we can do is we can let other people experiment with languages and language features, and we can let them throw shit against the wall, and then we can watch what sticks. We can take what sticks, and then we can propose that to ECMAScript and say, look, people are already doing this, it already works, it's great, blah, blah, blah. And so the more we do this, the more we make JavaScript better. And the more we make JavaScript better, the more we make the web uh, an incredible platform. And the better a platform it is, the better it's going to be for end users. And so we want to help, so how do we help? And, well, we come back to this question of how do you debug this generated code? And it really, it's very hard, and that's, that's why the Source Map project exists. Um, so the, the first thing I did when I started on this project was to uh, start looking at prior art. Who else has had this problem, and how did they solve it? And so the first thing I saw was there was this Java uh, spec, JSR045. And that basically allows people to debug uh, JVM bytecode that was generated from non-Java languages, such as like Scala or Clojure or whatever, and give the proper line numbers for there. And it was very informative. Um, I learned a lot from this, and it really helped you know helped me understand the problem domain. But they had a they they were trying to solve a very slightly different problem. They had different constraints. Um, they they had nothing to do with columns here. And columns are essential when you're debugging minified code, because if you think what happens in a minifier is it removes all white space and it puts everything on one long line. So your errors look like error on line one, column 500. And, you know, if you, if you aren't supporting regions of source code that are as fine-grained as column to column, then you can't support debugging minified code. Um, and so while I was doing all of this uh, research, the... Uh, John Lenz from the Clojure compiler team emailed me, and he's like, dude, we've been doing this like already. We're working on the same problem. Uh, check it out. And he already, they were doing columns because they're a minifier. And they also realized they had a lot of pragmatic choices, uh, such as they were making the map, the generated maps, very small. And that's good because you're debugging this stuff across an internet connection. And so you have to download it quickly. And if you're not downloading it quickly, then your development cycle is slowed down, and it, it just becomes that much harder to debug something. So we went with Clojure Compiler and teamed up with them because it was it was the uh, pragmatic choice. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the spec here. Um, I won't go too in-depth because it's really not as important as the, the grand ideas behind it. Um, but basically, if you are if you have a script and you have a source map for that script, you can kind of tell the browser, give it a little hint that one exists by saying inserting this comment pragma, you know, at source mapping URL, and then give it the URL. Um, everything is it's it's a valid JSON object or JSON blob, and you know, but mostly it's this one field in the JSON blob with this giant base sixty four encoded mapping. Um, you know, just to keep it small. Um, so what have I actually implemented? Uh, well, I wrote the core library to generate and parse uh, these source maps, and it's kind of a reference impl implementation. Um, I took great pains to make sure that this runs on Node.js because that's where, uh, where a lot of... I took great pains to make sure that this runs on Node.js because that's where a lot of these languages which compile the JavaScript are implemented on top of. It has to run inside Firefox because that's where our developer tools are. So uh, if, you, if you want to debug this stuff, it needs to be in Firefox. And it also runs in the browser. I have a, a link here to the GitHub. Um, so after I had this core library, 
I started working on integrating it with the web console. And so this is where you have your web console open and you get this error on this you know, source and this source line. And this is going to take that generated source and use the library to map it back to the original source. Um, and so this is almost ready to land. You can follow the bug here. I'm also hacking on CoffeeScript and Uglify.js so that um, during their compilation steps, they generate the source maps so we can then make use of it in the web console. And uh, I'd like to give you a little demo now. Uh, here we have this class, you know, that we're then extending to define, uh, you know, a subclass. And it has this greet method, which is going to return hello world. We're getting this list of items. Uh, this is coffee script, by the way. We're getting this list of items, you know, item one or item zero, item one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going through each of those and we're giving it the greet, the result of the greet method. So it should hello world all of these items. And there's a bug in this code, but I'll leave it out for now. And so normally, if you were to run this in Firefox, you get this error. And you'd say source map JS. I don't know what source map JS is. That's the generated code. I don't know anything about that. So you're like, okay, well, let's start to debug this. So we click on the link and pop it open in view source. Holy crap, what is that? I have no idea. This is generated JavaScript. And you know, CoffeeScript goes to great lengths to make sure that it's pretty JavaScript. But at the end of the day, this is still um, very scary to open this and then we go down here and there's this thing that kind of looks like the code that we wrote but we're still doing this manual translation phase um, so now you know I mean this just to give it the contrast it doesn't look like our original code um, but if we uh, integrate with source maps um, and this is if you apply the patch um, that is attached for that bug mentioned earlier um, we get this the same error, but the source and the line that you see um, on the right side, uh, it's abbreviated, but sourcemap.coffee, line 15, and that's the original source. And if we hover over that, we can still access the generated source, so it's not lost. You always have all the information, but we're just giving you more and defaulting to the most useful information. Um, so now we click on that sourcemap.coffee and we get our original source and it gives us the right line and we see oh you know 4i in 0 to 10 was where this so it's saying it is null and it was originally 0 to 10 is inclusive range and so uh, we should have done either 0 dot dot 9 or 0 dot 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 10 which is the exclusive range um, yeah but that's that's just an example of how we can we can map back to the correct sources and the correct line numbers. Um, so where where is this going to go in the future? The holy grail basically is to be able to set breakpoints and step through your original code in the debugger, and we'd love to make that happen, but it's a little bit off. Um, WebKit is going to start supporting this stuff. I don't have a timeline on that though. And then most importantly, we want you to write your language or extend JavaScript with your cool features and compile it back to browser compatible JavaScript and use source maps and you really support this. So I have a bunch of people that I, I really need to thank because this couldn't have happened without them. Uh, the first of all, uh, Jason Orendorf. Uh, I bugged this guy every single day on IRC and he never got frustrated with me. Um, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, Brendan, uh, just thanks for not firing me after I, the intern, was bugging you, the CTO, about how you needed to write a patch for me, and I needed it on time. Uh, there's not many places where an intern can bug the CTO like that and not have a stern talking to. Um, I'd like to thank John Lenz and the Clojure compiler team. I have nothing but respect for these guys. They, uh, they did the vast majority of this spec, and it's incredibly incredibly good um, I want to thank the developer tools team at Firefox or at Mozilla um, a bunch of great guys very supporting um, I want to thank Julie Jill and Kimber for um, you know making my internship such a happy time thank the rest of the Mozilla interns I made a lot of friends over the summer and uh, everyone who supports the open web thank you